Hi, it is time for another First Chapter Friday with Green High School Library. I'm going to read part of Chapter 1. There's a breaking point that the author has created, and I will be stopping about halfway through Chapter 1. But this week's book is in honor of Red Ribbon Week, which will start next week. And it's entitled A Plague Year by Edward Bloor. And you're probably wondering why I have this printout of the book instead of the actual book. It's because the book's cover is kind of shiny and you don't get the image like you do with the paper. You can see the blue meth lines coming off the spoon. Uh, this, this book's title actually comes from another book written a long time ago, entitled A Plague Year, but it was about the bubonic plague, which is different than our meth epidemic. I recommend this book, even though the topic is very dark, uh, it's very sometimes difficult to read because the drug epidemic has hit our little town so furiously and so devastatingly that everyone knows somebody that's had to struggle with drugs and alcohol. Um, but there's a positive twist. And what I really like about it is that it's the kids that end up making the difference and inspiring the adults to make and improve their little town and what's going on. Um, and I just, I think that's a positive note when those who are most affected end up helping to solve the problem. So a plague year by Edward Bloor, chapter one, Monday, September 10th, 2001. I was staring through the window of dad's van when I saw the shopping cart stranded like a lost dog at the corner of Sunbury Street and Lower Falls Road. The green plastic trim and the white food giant logo identified it as one of ours. Maybe a customer had wheeled it illegally to a house around the corner, unloaded it, and then wheeled it back to the spot in an effort to say, I didn't really steal this. I was just borrowing it. You can have it back now. Whatever. It wouldn't be there for long. Bobby Smalls would pass this way in 10 minutes. He would spot the cart and then comment bitterly about the person who had left it there since he'd have to retrieve it as his first job of the day. Dad turned right and our van bumped across the dark expanse of blacktop in front of the supermarket. The food giant sign was still in its low wattage setting glowing like a rectangular nightlight for the town of Blackwater. Dad is the general manager of this food giant. He spends most of his waking life there. Although it was still an hour before opening and the lot was empty, he backed our Dodge Caravan into an outer space, a requirement for all employees. He asked, Do you want me to leave it running, Tom? No, I'll just open a window. Okay, I'll leave the keys in case you change your mind. I'll be about 15 minutes, provided the system is up. I yawned. Okay, and lowered the electric window before he could turn the key. Plan A was that Dad would drive me to school, which meant I would get there way early before anybody, which meant that no one would see me being dropped off by a parent. This was infinitely better than plan B. In plan B, mom would drop me off later in front of everybody, which meant that I might as well be wearing a yellow patrol boy vest and carrying a Pokemon lunchbox. But first we had to stop at the food giant because the centralized reporting system had been down the night before, so dad hadn't been able to input all his sales figures, reorders, etc and send them to the corporate office. In theory, he would input, the, input those figures now, 
and we would be gone before the opening shift arrived at 645. I watched him walk across the large rolling parking lot. The food giant was built, like much of Blackwater, on the uneven landscape of Pennsylvania coal country. If a shopping cart got away from you in this lot, it would roll for 50 yards, building up to a speed of 20 miles per hour before it crashed into a parked vehicle. That could do some serious damage, as any cart retriever would tell you. Dad disabled the alarm, unlocked the automatic doors, and slipped inside. I opened my PSAT prep book and hoping to get in a few minutes of study time. But that was not to be. First I looked up and I saw Bobby's mother drop him off, 15 minutes early as usual. He was wearing his green food giant slicker in case of rain. Bobby was always prepared. The Boy Scouts just said it. Bobby lived it. After listening impatiently to some final words from his mother, he pushed away from the Explorer and started walking towards Sunbury Street. After listening impatiently to some final words from his mother, he pushed away from the Explorer and started walking back towards Sunbury Street and that abandoned cart. Mrs. Smalls drove on to her good job at the Good Samaritan Hospital. Then, just as I returned to my book, a louder engine sound disturbed me. A black tow truck, driving too fast, bounced across the parking lot and took a hard left at the ATM. Its high-mounted headlights flashed right before my eyes. Then the driver killed the lights and backed up to the front of the store. A man in a hooded sweatshirt and a black ski mask jumped out on the passenger side. He reached into the back of the truck and rolled out a metal hook so large I could see it clearly from 200 feet away. He wedged the hook into a slot in the ATM and gave the driver a hand signal. The truck lurched forward, creating a god-awful sound. I was now sitting bolt upright and staring at them. They were trying to rip the ATM out of the wall and make off with it. Steal the whole thing and crack it up open later for cash inside. Suddenly to my right, I saw a figure approaching. It was Bobby Smalls. He came running back clumsily in his green rain slicker without the cart. He started waving his arms and shouting at the robbers. I thought, oh no, Bobby, not now. Keep away from them. I slid over into the driver's seat and grabbed the steering wheel, trying to think what to do. I started pounding on the horn, making as big a racket as I could. The driver dressed in the same type of dark disguise, stepped out of the truck. He was holding a strange object. It took me a few seconds to realize what it was, a compound bow. He then produced a feathered arrow, knocked it, and aimed it right at Bobby's shorts, advancing body. The beeping horn got Dad's attention. He appeared behind the glass in the entranceway, looking bewildered. He pulled the door open and stepped outside, holding on to one hand toward Bobby like a traffic cop trying to get him to halt. The bowman changed his aim from Bobby to Dad, and then back again. Was he going to shoot one of them? Or shoot one, reload, and get the other? Or was he just trying to scare them? I couldn't take the chance. I cranked the car key and hit the gas pedal. The old van roared like an angry lion. I yanked at the gear shift, still revving the engine, and dropped it into drive. The van took off with a squeal of spinning tires and rocketed across the parking lot. The bow and arrow guy turned toward me and froze like a deer caught in the headlights. Then he aimed the bow right at me. I thought, can an arrow pierce the windshield? He must have asked himself that same question and decided it could not. He lowered his weapon, tossed it into the cab, and climbed back into the driver's seat. I continued to accelerate toward the truck, closing the gap quickly, like I was going to ram it. Honestly, I had no idea what I was going to do. By now, the other man had unhooked the cable and had scrabbled inside the cab, too. The truck lurched forward and drove right at me, like in a deadly game of chicken. I hit the brakes and steered to the right, throwing the van into a wild skid, 
stopping just feet away from the frozen-in-place figure of Bobby Smalls. The tow truck continued across the parking lot, shot across Route 16, accelerating away into the darkness. I turned off the van's engine, threw open the door, and hopped out. Suddenly, everything was quiet. Dad came running from his spot by the door. He had a frantic look in his eyes. He started waving his hands back and forth to get Bobby's attention. Bobby! Bobby, are you okay? Bobby didn't answer. He was fumbling around under the green plastic slicker. He pulled out a cell phone and held it up. I got to call my mom. Dad nodded. His face was perspiring. Yes, yes. He turned to me. And you, Tom, are you okay? Yeah, sure. That was smart thinking, honking the horn like that. Thanks. But drive right at him? Where they could shoot you? Not so smart. I thought they were going to shoot Bobby and you. Dad looked at me curiously, like the second part of that had never occurred to him. Me? He shook all over like he'd had a sudden chill. Well, thanks, then. Bobby was now angry at his phone. His stubby fingers had punched in the wrong number. He was about to dash it to the ground when Dad stepped forward and calmly took it away. I'll call your mother, Bobby. Dad quickly pressed some phone keys. Bobby seemed confused. You know her number? Sure, I call her all the time. You do? Yeah. Why? To tell her what a good job you're doing. Bobby's eyes widened upon hearing the praise. He loved praise. He thrived on it. My dad spoke into the phone. Hello, Miss Smalls. It's Gene Coleman at the Food Giant. Yes, yes, Bobby's okay. But we've had an, an incident here. An attempted robbery. Bobby helped to chase the robbers away. Dad listened for a moment. It seemed like he was getting an earful. Sure, sure, I understand. We'll probably be outside by the front door. He hung up and told Bobby, Okay, your mother's on her way. What for? To check to see if you're all right. I'm all right. I know. She just wants to make sure. Can I use your phone to call the police? Yeah, go ahead. Dad called 911 and spoke to an operator. I craned my head forward to make eye contact with Bobby. I asked him, What were you thinking there, dude? You could have gotten killed. Bobby answered loudly, impatiently, as if the answer was obvious. They're thieves! Yes, they're thieves. I'll bet they're murderers, too. I'll bet they'd have murdered you if you'd gone a step closer. I'm not afraid of stupid thieves. He had a bow and arrow, Bobby. That's a deadly weapon. You should be afraid of that. All you had was your cell phone. If they're so brave, why are they wearing ski masks and covering up with hoods? They're just thieves, that's all. Stupid thieves. Five minutes later, the police and Mrs. Smalls arrived at the same moment from opposite directions. Two police officers got out of the car and split up. One interviewed Dad, Bobby, and me. The other examined the ATM and walked around the lot looking for evidence. I told the police officer what I knew, trying to sound no-nonsense and cop-like. It was a black tow truck. It didn't say anything on the side. Two men were in it. They had ski mask on. They had a homemade bow. They had at least one arrow. They took off when I drove at them. They went out the same way they came in. Bobby gave a much more spirited account of what had happened and how stupid the two thieves were. Mrs. Smalls took Bobby's pulse, temperature, and blood pressure right there in the parking lot, much to his annoyance. She seemed satisfied with the results, but she did explain to my dad, Bobby's system is delicate, Mr. Coleman. It's all part of Down syndrome. He may appear to be fine, but that can be deceiving. He can't take too much stress. Down's patients are susceptible to heart attacks and strokes. My dad nodded solemnly. Yes, ma'am. You do what you have to do with Bobby. Take him home for a rest if he needs it.
Bobby threw up his hands in frustration, so his mother quickly added, No, that won't be necessary. But no more excitement today, Bobby. Okay? You take it slow today. Bobby grumbled. Yeah, I'll take it slow. He pointed to the store. I'll be like Reg the Veg today. I'll take it slow. Real slow. The sun was now rising behind the store. By seven, the back parking spaces started to fill in with employees from the early shift. Gert, the head baker, marched straight to the front door with barely a sideways glance to us or the cops. So did Walter from customer service. Mitchell, the head of the meat department, veered over our way and slowed down to listen, but he never really stopped. Uno did, though. He's the assistant manager in charge of opening up. He looked at my dad and held out his hands out wide, as if to say, What gives? Reg the Veg stopped, too. He's the produce manager. He pointed at the police car and whispered hoarsely, WTF, man? I replied, Robbery attempt on the ATM. Reg started hollering at no one in particular. WTF, man! WTF! Uno, whose name is really John Rolnick, was a little more focused. Did anybody get hurt, Tom? No, I added. But Bobby could have. My dad, too. The robbers were ten yards away from them, and they had a compound bow. Uno shook his head. Wow, compound bow. I know guys who hunt with those. Do you think they were guys from around here? I have no idea. I stood around talking to people for a little while longer, telling them what I knew about the incident. Eventually, I heard the sound of a car creeping up behind me. I turned and saw a green Taurus. My mom was at the wheel, and my sister Lily was sitting next to her. Plan B was obviously in effect. Dad must have called home. I walked back to the Dodge van. It was straddling two spaces, like it had been left there in mid-skid. I pointed to the far side of the parking lot, calling to Mom. Pick me up out by the road. I climbed in, started the van, and drove it carefully to its original space. Uno, Reg, and Bobby went inside to do their opening checklist jobs. Dad went in to call the corporate office. Mom got out of her car and hurried into the store behind him, and she didn't come back for a long time. She was freaking out in there, I'm sure. I spent the time thinking about this. The day could have begun horribly with two murders, or even three if they had shot me through the windshield, or ran me in that game of chicken. The food giant could have a huge gash in its front wall, where the ATM had been ripped out and a lot of money stolen. But none of that had happened. I took a moment to give myself credit. I had driven the thieves away. It could have been a horrible day or a much worse than it turned out to be day. A day that destroyed lives. Instead, from here on out, it would be a normal day. And that's the breaking point the author has provided in Chapter 1. This is A Plague Year by Edward Bloor. And it is... The first chapter Friday from the Green High School Library.